right, we're going to go ahead and get started. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Taryn Rivera, and I'm the photo archivist at the Houston History Research Center. And in today's presentation, we're going to be exploring the history of the Julia Ideson Building, which houses the Houston History Research Center. Um, so the photo here at right is the building in 1932, and that is from our Houston Press Collection. And we will be taking some time at the end of the presentation for questions. So the Julia Ideson Building, or JIB, was constructed in 1926, so that makes it nearly 100 years old. Its centennial is just three years away in 2026. The building served as Houston Public Library's central branch for 50 years until the construction of the Jesse Jones Building next door. And here pictured at left is the Julia Ideson Building, um, which was then called the Central Library. And that's from an undated postcard from our Houston Postcard Collection. Though historic in its own right, the Julia Ideson Building is not the first central library of the Houston Public Library System. The first permanent central building was called the Carnegie Library, and that was constructed in 1904 at McKinney and Travis Street. So funding for that library was secured from several women's groups in the Houston area after successfully petitioning Andrew Carnegie for funding. The Carnegie Building cost $50,000 to construct, and it resembled a neoclassical temple, complete with a domed roof, porticos, and wide front steps. And pictured here is an undated postcard of the Carnegie Library, also from the Houston Postcard Collection. By 1920, the original Carnegie Library could no longer keep up with Houston's burgeoning population, and city librarian Julia Ideson expressed her concern that the space was too small and cramped to accommodate the demand for more books. In 1919, Houston Mayor A.E. Ammerman suggested that a new library be built on Buffalo Bayou, with Julia Ideson in agreement. By 1920, local architect William W. Watkins had drawn up a plan for the proposed building in order to gain public support for a $250,000 bond to have the new library built. And pictured here is a photo of the Carnegie Library staff in 1920 from the Julia Ideson collection. And you can actually see Julia Ideson um, towards the right second from right, and she's labeled number six. The bond was rejected by city council, however, and the project needed a restart. In May 1922, the library board brought their proposed $200,000 bond for the new library directly to a public vote in an election. The public voted in favor of the bond on May 6, 1922, and a new building committee was created in partnership with Julia Ideson, and it was chaired by Reverend Harris Masterson, Jr. And here at left, you can see another photo of Julia Ideson. So soon after the bond passed, building sites were being planned. The first proposed site was a block of land bordered by McKinney Street, Lamar Avenue, Louisiana, and Smith Street. The only catch was that the property contained the residence of the late Thomas W. House, and House's son was actually a member of city council, and he stood to make a profit if the land was sold to the city. So this was kind of unethical and against the city's charter, so the site was not selected. And today that is actually where the Wells Fargo building uh, is located. And pictured here is the TW House residence. And that comes from our domestic architecture 
Junior League collection. So the second proposed site was at McKinney and Smith Street, only a street away from the first proposed site. So this was the site eventually chosen and where the Julia Edison building stands today. And in this clipping from the Houston Chronicle on May 17, 1922, the site is described as a block of ground bounded by Brazos and Smith Streets and McKinney and Lamar Avenues. It lies immediately south of the Martha Herman Square and one block east of one entrance to Sam Houston Park. The property will cost in the neighborhood of $100,000, and according to arrangements made, the payments would be spread over a period of 10 years. The property did eventually sell for $92,500, so adjusted for inflation, this would be equal to about $3 million today. Meanwhile, an architect uh, needed to be secured for design of the new library building. Julia Idison herself actually toured several libraries across New England and the Northeast, including those in New York City, Utica and Buffalo, New York, Detroit, Michigan, St. Louis, Missouri, Chicago, Illinois, Cleveland, Ohio, Newark, New Jersey, Wilmington, Delaware, and Providence, Rhode Island. And while touring the library, she kept in mind the challenges being faced in her own Carnegie Library at home and how to meet the needs of the growing Houston population. And pictured here are the uh, libraries that Julia Idison might have toured. There is the library in Providence, Rhode Island, which was constructed in 1904. The library in Detroit, Michigan, which was constructed in 1921 and the library in Wilmington, Delaware, also constructed in 1920. In November of 1922, after much deliberation and back and forth between the architectural firms and library board, the board decided to use the Boston architectural firm Cram and Ferguson, with Ralph A. Cram being in charge of the library's design. Local Houston architects Lewis Glover and William W. Watkin were named associate architects on the project. Cram was a well-known architect at the time and designed prominent buildings such as West Point, Princeton, and the Rice Institute in Houston. He had also worked on several Houston projects with Watkin, such as the Trinity Episcopal Church and the Houston Museum of Fine Arts. And pictured here, you can see a preliminary sketch of the building by Cram and Fer Ferguson Architects. And that comes from the Houston Public Library collection um, from April 27th, 1923. Though most architectural design in the early 20s revolved around neoclassicism and the influence of Greek and Roman design, Ralph Cram of Cram and Ferguson did not share the same taste. He instead embraced the Spanish Renaissance style, partly, uh, possibly in part due to a recent trip to Spain. And he envisioned the design of the new library to resemble that of the Fachada de la Universidad and Alcalá de Henares, which was constructed in 1537 in Madrid, Spain. And here you can see a modern photo of the university today, and that's courtesy of Britannica.com. So as you can see, Cram's design of the front facade of the building very much resembles the facade of the university in Madrid. Both have a central register with wings on either side and pilasters, which are those shallow kind of rectangular pillars to accentuate the wings. Both buildings also have detailed moldings surrounding the front door with a row of round arched windows at the tallest levels. So you can see with these side-by-side -side photos really how the architects were influenced by Spanish Renaissance architecture. At left is the drawing of the university from the Museo de Prado. 
And at left is a photo of the entrance, sorry, at right is a photo of the entrance to the new building. And that's from our Houston Public Library collection. So Julia Idison also played a large role in the design and function of the new library building. She prepared a detailed plan of the building. It would be three stories tall with a finished basement. The first floor would house the children's area, a reading room, an auditorium and administrative offices. The second floor would serve as the main floor for customers with a central delivery hall, reference room and additional study rooms. The librarian's offices would be located on a mezzanine between the second and third floors and the third floor would hold special collections and additional offices. And this design choice reflected a growing change in library culture and what was expected of a library that was open to the public. So in addition to being a place to research and read, it would also be a place of community, providing a meeting space for Houstonians to participate in other cultural activities. This was a change from early reviews regarding the purpose of the library, which was largely hands off to the public, um, with librarians serving as gatekeepers to the information held within. And this practice of libraries as places of community continues today, with spaces devoted to early learning, art galleries, guest lectures, passport services, and much more. And here at the right, you can see the interior of the original Carnegie Library in 1917. Um, so the room was clearly a bit crowded, especially with a line of patrons waiting to check out their books. So it was clear that a larger space was needed for the community. Between the end of 1922 and mid-1923, the architects went back and forth with the Library Board of Trustees in approving the architectural plans. One chief concern, as most of us can probably relate to, uh, was the Houston heat and the cross ventilation that would be available throughout the building. So although air conditioning had made its debut at the 1904 Missouri World's Fair, Fully air conditioned buildings had a long way to go. The first air conditioned room debuted in Houston in 1922 in the Rice Hotel's cafeteria. The first public building to be fully air conditioned, the Milan Building in San Antonio, would not be completed until 1928. So fully air conditioned buildings would not become mainstream for a long time. Until then, architects in the South had to be smart about keeping the heat outside and allowing breezes to circulate throughout the buildings. And it left is a photo of the Rice Hotel cafeteria in the early 1920s, and that's from our Litter Sticks and Photographs collection. By April of 1923, Cram's design had the approval of the library board. Reverend Masterson, director of the board, wrote a very thorough, long description of the new building, which was published in the Houston Chronicle on April 26, 1923. In it, he described the style of the building as Spanish Renaissance, so replete with historical associations of Texas and the Southwest, with natural light and cross ventilation throughout the building, and that the building will have an atmosphere both exciting and dignified. And here you can see a small clip of the full page article that was written by Masterson for the Houston Chronicle. In addition to its appearance, Masterson also described the educational importance of the library as on par with local public schools, with librarians being paid salaries comparative to those of school teachers. Masterson also described the children's area of the new library, which would be on the first floor, and contained space for story times that could accommodate up to 150 children, a reading room, and a dressing room for the children's librarian. 
This area of the library, according to Masterson, received the most attention in the design because it was felt that here would be started the reading public of the future. And pictured here is an architectural drawing of the first floor of the new central library, and that comes from our Houston Public Library collection. And you can see the children's area with a large reading room at the top left and a story time room at the top right. The second floor called the main level of the library was dedicated to a large reading room and it would have two open air loggias which are kind of small open balconies at the north and south sides of the building. Interestingly, Masterson describes in his article, outdoor reading rooms where patrons can smoke as they read. So times have kind of changed. Uh, we don't really allow smoking and reading in the building at the same time. In this early version, uh, architectural drawing of the building. You can see one of the open air loggias at the bottom of the drawing. The third floor of the building was, be, was to be dedicated to a medical library and also special collections, local history, genealogy, and displays of artifacts donated by Sigmund J. Westheimer. Masterson also described a soundproof room in which customers could listen to phonograph records without disturbing other visitors. And there was even a plan to eventually circulate these records, which according to Masterson was very in vogue in many libraries. And it left us this architectural drawing of the second floor reading room, also from our Houston Public Library collection. On June 2nd, 1924, the groundbreaking for the new Central Library commenced. While construction was being completed, funding of the library was still being hammered out, with a last minute agreement by the mayor to use funds from the 1926 city's general funds account. Construction was eventually completed in June 1925. At left is a photo of the library the year it opened. That's from our Litter's Dixon photo collection, and it was facing the building from McKinney Street. And at right, also from our Houston Public Library collection, is a back view of the building uh, as it looked from Lamar Street. The new library officially opened on October 17, 1926. The ceremony included Edgar Odell Lovett, president of the Rice Institute, Houston Mayor Oscar Holcomb, and Henry H. Dixon, who is the new president of the Board of Trustees. Julia Ideson was still the city librarian, and she was kind of the champion of this new building. So she gave a speech in honor of the occasion. The interior of the completed building, in keeping with it, the Spanish Renaissance architectural design, contained exposed beams, oak woodwork, red tile flooring, and cork flooring in the main reading room. In this article from the Houston Chronicle, a week after its opening, it was described as the finest library in the entire South. To celebrate the opening of the new children's department in the new central building, a special event was held on October 23, 1926. Miss Emma Lee, the children's librarian, read stories, and the Heights Children's Library Theater did a one-act play called The Princess and the Swineherd. The Carnegie Branch Children's Library Theater presented Cinderella and Mrs. Edgar Harvey, accompanied by Mr. Horton Corbett, did some vocal selections. And the children's room was called the Norma Meldrum Room. So here you can see a photo of the room from the Houston Press in 1931. So the name of the room had its roots in the original Carnegie Library building before the new Central Library was built. 
1899, Norman and Minnie Meldrum donated funds to the library to create a children's room in honor of their eight-year-old daughter, Norma, who had died of scarlet fever in 1899. The initial gift consisted of $5,000 invested for income and $1,000 for the first purchase of equipment and books suitable for children from eight to 15 years of age. So to put this in perspective, the initial gift of $6,000 in 1899 would be the equivalent to about $212,000 today. They also established a materials fund to purchase books. The materials fund established by Norma's parents continues to supply the Houston Public Library with circulating materials for children. And at left, you'll see a picture of Norma when she was a year old. And that is actually from a book called The City of Houston and Harris County, Texas Columbian Exposition Souvenirs. And then at right, you can see a framed portrait of Norma at eight years old. And this actually still hangs in the Meldrum room today of the Julia Ideson building. Today, the Meldrum Room is not open to the general public. So instead of circulating children's books, it's a research for collection for people conducting research into the history of children's literature. And customers are allowed to request books from the room to view. Um, you just have to fill out a form in the main research room. And here we have the first floor lobby as it originally was on the left. And at right is how it looks today. And you can see that the original oak ceilings are still intact, as well as the original Spanish red tile. And here we see at left a view of the main floor reading room as it originally looked in 1926 from the Houston Public Library collection. And today the space still looks a lot the same and it's still used as a reading and study room. The original oak woodwork and marble columns have been preserved and the tables, chairs, and built-in bookshelves are also original to the room. The Venus de Milo statue that stands in front of the far window was a gift to the Carnegie Library by the Public School Art League, which was the parent organization of the present Museum of Fine Arts Houston, and it has been in the library since 1926. And here at left, we see a view from the third floor mezzanine as it originally appeared. And the photo at right shows the mezzanine today, and it looks nearly unchanged from its original design nearly 100 years ago. The modern color photo shows the bright colors of the coffered ceiling. Also of note are the beautifully covered, colored paper mache friezes underneath the wooden railings, and they are the in tones of red, gold, and blue. Each circle in the frieze actually depicts an insignia of one of the great libraries of the world. In the years following the library's opening, it was planned that additions would be added to the building, including extending the rear wing out to Lamar Avenue. Unfortunately, the Great Depression had hit and extra funding was never secured. However, the library did receive public works funding for murals that were added to the original building between 1934 and 1936. The three murals located in the west corner of the first floor were painted by Angela McDonnell and are titled Avila, The Excuses for Conquest, La Rabida, Cradle of the New World, and Toledo, Art and Literature in Spain. The last of the three Spanish themed murals completed on the first floor um, was Toledo, and it was featured in an article in the Houston Chronicle on September 22, 1935. 
The article notes that the mural was painted at the artist Angela McDonald's studio on 908 Stewart Street. And it describes the mural as depicting the golden age of Spanish art and literature, including Cervantes' Don Quixote, as well as painter El Greco. And McDonald is said to have traveled to Spain between 1931 and 1932, where she made preliminary sketches for the mural. Another mural added in 1935 depicted the first meeting of the Houston Lyceum Committee entitled The First Subscription Drive by Ruth Euler. The mural is located in the main stairway between the first and second floors. In an article by the Houston Chronicle published June 26, 1935, the mural is described as depicting the first fundraising drive for books for the library. Euler even found descendants of these first fundraisers and used old family albums as the basis for her portraits. And the article also mentions that even though no women were members of the official fundraising committee, um, she wanted to show the community members calling on a family to raise funds in order to show the important role women played in fundraising efforts. At right is the uh, clipping of the original 1935 Houston Chronicle article, and the photo at left shows the mural as it looks today in 2023. Another edition of murals by Houston artist Emma Richardson Cherry was also commissioned by the Public Works Administration between 1934 and 1936 and are located on the second floor of the library. So these murals marked kind of a departure from the Spanish and library themed murals of the library building, and they depicted different historic places in Texas. So you have the Texas President's Home, also called the Texas White House of Sam Houston during the Republic the Texas Republic's Capitol Building in Houston, Beauvoir, which was the Mississippi home of Jefferson Davis, who was actually a former president during the Civil War, and Arlington, the home of Mary Custis, who was the wife of Confederate General Robert E. Lee uh, during the Civil War. And at left is a photo of one of the murals as it looks today. On July 15th, 1945, Julia Ideson, who um, was the longtime director and advocate for the Houston Public Library, passed away. And in 1951, in a proclamation by Mayor Oscar Holcomb, the Central Library was officially renamed the Julia Ideson Building, the name it still carries today. The building still honors Ideson, and her portrait hangs in two different locations in the building. You can see one on the first floor corridor, and that's alongside portraits of each succeeding Houston Public Library director. The other, an oil painting portrait, hangs in the second floor corridor. And at left, you can see the proclamation by Mayor Holcomb in 1951. And on the right, you can see um, the current view of the library directors and Julia Ideson is the very first one on the far left. Over a period of years in the mid to late 1950s, the building was remodeled for the addition of air conditioning, which caused many changes to the original design. Several of the outdoor loggias were enclosed, decorative plaster was removed, and false ceilings were suspended to hide the air conditioning ducts but it also hid the original oak ceiling beams. In 1976, the Julia Ideson Building was replaced as HPL's central location by the Jesse Jones Building, which was constructed next door and connected by a large plaza to the Ideson Building. 
After 50 years, the historic building could no longer provide the library space needed for such a large metropolitan city. In 1977, the Julia Idison Building was listed on the National Register for Historic Places. During this time, the city of Houston applied for federal funding under the Emergency Local Public Works Grant and received over $3.2 million for a much needed restoration of the Idison building. An additional $591,000 was raised by the city in bond funds. The renovation was conducted by S.I. Morris Associates, which was the same firm that had constructed the new Jesse Jones Library Building, the Wortham Theater, and the historic Astronome and work on the Idison building was completed in 1979. Many of the alterations made during the 1950s renovations were reversed. Um, window blinds were removed for better natural light. They also removed the false dropped ceilings, once again exposing the original oak beams. And it was also during this time that the Houston Metropolitan Research Center was established. Um, which is now known as the Houston History Research Center as of 2023. The Julia Idison Building was now home to Houston's Historic Archives, and the research room was located in the second floor reading room. In 2006, it was recognized that the Idison Building was in need of updating in order to safely house the historic archives. The Julia Idison Library Preservation Partners, consisting of Phoebe Tudor, Margaret Sarr, and Minette Basil, was formed, and they were committed to raising funds for additional restoration work to the Idison building. Backed by $10 million of funding from the City of Houston, the committee was determined to raise the additional $28 million to complete the project. The architectural firm Ginsler was chosen for the project, with lead architect Barry Moore overseeing preservation of the building. And at left, you can see a photo of the coffered ceiling above the third floor mezzanine, and that's courtesy of the Julia Idison Library Preservation Partners. The research room, called the Texas Room, would be relocated to the first floor with the addition of an extended third wing that had originally been proposed by the building's original architect, Ralph Cram, 80 years prior. The expanded west wing of the building would also house three floors of archival storage located above the Texas Room. The stack space would be equipped with a new climate control system that would keep the archival materials at a cool temperature with controlled humidity, which is a necessity for the often hot and muggy Houston weather. The second floor space, which had previously housed the Texas Room Research Room um, beginning in the 1970s, would once again be home to the reading room for the public as originally designed in 1926. Across the hall from the reading room, the space would be converted to a new exhibit hall. Also added to the building would be a conservation lab to care for collection materials and a digitization lab on the first floor to scan and conserve photos, maps, and documents. Also, a new enclosed courtyard with a wrought iron fence and landscaping would be added outside for use of the public. Groundbreaking began on the new additions to the building on January 12, 2009, and was attended by Mayor Bill White. The first phase of the project, construction of the new wing, was completed with a ribbon cutting ceremony by the mayor on December 7, 2009. Work on the interior of the building continued on, and in 2011, restoration of the interior was completed. Floors were repaired and special lighting was installed to highlight artwork and murals in the building. The 1930s murals in the building were cleaned and restored. 
The subscription mural received restoration treatment by art conservator Nathan Sutton, removing 76 years worth of dust and grime that had accumulated on the oil painting. And at right is a photo of the mural's restoration, courtesy of the Houston Chronicle. The official completion of the restoration was marked with a ribbon cutting and dedication ceremony by Mayor Anise Parker on December 5th, 2011. Today, the Julia Idison Building is protected by the Texas Historical Commission as a state antiquities landmark, a recorded Texas historic landmark, and listed in the National Register of Historic Places. And it continues to be a place of research, learning, and culture, exactly as Julia Idison intended nearly 100 years ago. And at left, you can see the historical marker, which is in front of the building. And at right is the building as it looks today. And that concludes the presentation. Thank you for listening. I hope you enjoyed our presentation on the history of the Julia Idison building from its beginning in 1926 to its current status as a location for Houston history and research. Um, if you do have any questions or comments about the presentation, you can contact our reference email. I hope everyone has a great day. Thank you.